It is my pleasure to introduce our luncheon speaker. Theodore Malik has extensive experience in both world monetary systems and international governmental policy. He served on the executive board of the World Economic Forum, which hosts the Davos meeting annually in Switzerland. He held an ambassadorial level position for the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, and he headed consulting at Wharton Chase Econometrics. He has worked in international capital markets at Salomon Brothers and has served in senior policy positions at the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and in the U.S. State Department. He is currently a research professor for the Spiritual Capital Initiative at Yale University. Dr. Malik earned his Ph.D. in International Political Economy from the University of Toronto, and he took a Master's of Literature degree from Aberdeen University in Scotland, and a BA from Gordon College in Massachusetts. So he is uh, certainly well-traveled with his education. He is here today to speak on the subject of America's Spiritual Capital, which is the title of his latest book, co-authored with Nicholas Capaldi. Please welcome Dr. Theodore Malik. Thank you, Anita. I, I need to thank uh, Hillsdale College for putting together such a brilliant um, forum. Certainly our friends at the um, Council of Christian Colleges and Universities, and in particular I'd like to thank my former student, uh, Ron Mahiran, who's here today and has been your interlocutor on putting that together. And then I want to single out for special attention over here at our first table, Nick Capaldi, my co-author of this little book, America's Spiritual Capital. Nick, Nick is, I think, the most important uh, Catholic philosopher in America today, and I'm very pleased to have had the chance not only to interact with him on this book, but over a lifetime of experiences at Liberty Fund and elsewhere. Now, if there's anything at all you like about our argument, I will accept all the praise. And if there is something that you dislike, which is remotely possible, or with which you might want to take issue, I, I really want to offer up Nick as someone who you can blame. <laughs> now, you might know as well, and I need to mention this, that I am the product of one of your colleges, Gordon College, even though today I'm doing missionary work at uh, Yale University. So um, here's the speech. America is a market-oriented, center-right polity and the modern exemplar of the Judeo-Christian heritage of spiritual capital. Let me present two theses in this regard and demonstrate what they mean for governing and markets, which is, after all, the theme of your forum. The first thesis concerns the logic of modernity. What distinguishes modernity is the technological project, the transformation of nature for human betterment as opposed to fatalistic conformity. The technological project requires inner-directed individuals and free market economies that maximize competition and innovation. Free market economies operate best with limited government Montesquieu's Commercial Republic, and Madison's Federalist Number 10. Limited government can only be maintained under the rule of law. The rule of law can only be sustained if there is a larger cultural context that celebrates responsible individual autonomy. Finally, responsible individual autonomy presupposes a larger ontological claim about human freedom or free will that requires a theology. Moreover, personal autonomy avoids self-destruction and adds a spiritual content to the technological project itself when the responsible use of freedom leads to fulfilling or helping to fulfill God's plan by eliminating suffering and promoting freedom in and for others. 
Now, recognizing, pursuing, and sustaining autonomy are the spiritual quests of modernity and the technological project, which I believe is best evidenced in the American experiment. To discover that our greatest sense of fulfillment comes from freely imposing order on ourselves in order to impose a creative order on the world is perhaps the closest way of coming to know God. Three considerations lead us to maintain that responsible personal autonomy requires theological support. First, personal autonomy presupposes free will. This amounts to saying that there is no naturalistic or scientific explanation of the ultimate truths about who we are. Second, we understand ourselves as historical beings, but history does not form a self-explanatory system. Our interpretation of the whole human drama depends on an intimately personal decision concerning the part we are meant to play in it. In the end, this is a religious decision, not a scientific or a scholarly one. Finally, sustaining our autonomy under trying circumstances requires spiritual stamina. Since naturalism and scientism fail, theology in some important sense emerges as the only discipline that can provide ultimate comprehension. The second thesis is the documented history of how settlers, mostly religious immigrants, to these United States, my family and your families, brought this larger view to America, nourished it, and sustained it, at least up till now. The most important historical development in the last 400 years has been the rise of the technological project. This project, not the market, is the starting point of our narrative because although there have always been markets, it is only since the 17th century that markets have come to play such a dominant role in our lives. It is the presence of the technological project that explains the centrality of markets. The following claims with regard to the technological project can be made. First, it is an irreversible historical fact. Abandonment of the project would have catastrophic consequences for humanity and threaten our very existence. Second, to the extent that the project creates environmental or other kinds of problems, and I admit it does on occasion, we are now irrevocably committed to using future developments in that project to address and hopefully solve those problems. Third, those cultures, and we talked about this a little bit this morning, which have most fully embraced the technological project, I would include amongst them military technologies, have come to dominate the world and to spread the technological project. The spread has not been a matter of the powerful imposing on the weak, the weak have largely come to embrace the project on their own. The thorny issues of globalization would not have developed outside the context of the technological project. Let's look at it again, taking a long view. Starting with Copernicus, Western thinkers became aware of how much of what we understand reflects the human perspective as did the artists themselves in the Renaissance. Copernicus, for example, maintained that despite appearances, the sun does not rise and set, rather the earth turns on its axis. Starting with Copernicus and reinforced by the works of Galileo, Descartes, Newton, and others, Western thinkers came to recognize how much of science depended not on naive observation of surface phenomenon, but on the construction of hypothetical even mathematical models about hidden structure. Newton and Leibniz would go on later to invent calculus. Meaning and structure, in a word truth, were not to be found externally, but in the internal models of the human mind. Wisdom and success were transformed from conformity to an external structure to heading or conforming the external physical world 
to human reason and imagination. The belief that human beings could understand and control the hidden structure of nature and that the hidden structure was conducive to human benefit was largely inspired by Christianity. Among the first to proclaim the technological project as a self-conscious undertaking was Francis Bacon when he proclaimed that knowledge is power. And Rene Descartes, the French philosopher, mathematician, physicist, who advocated that human beings make themselves the masters and possessors of nature. It is worth noting that Descartes specifically singled out the importance of advances in medical science for an age in which the normal human lifespan was just 36 years. It was also Descartes who, in his discourse on method, advocated the development of interdirected individuals cooperating, I underline the word cooperating, Father spoke about that last night, to produce innovative ideas for understanding and controlling natural processes. Finally, Descartes, who also recognized how commercial republics like Holland in the 17th century were particularly hospitable to these new developments. They were traders. The technological project is fostered by an environment in which human beings are given as much free reign as possible to use their imagination, to think scientifically, and to develop new ways and products for humanity controlling the physical environment to protect and heal the human body, and to make life more comfortable, and to make life more enjoyable. The economic institution most conductive to this was the free market economy, a system for the exchange of goods and services wherein there is no central allocation of such goods and services. The market economy was not itself entirely new. In fact, it could be maintained that private property had always existed in historical memory. The church, moreover, had officially defended the importance of private property. What was new was the recognition of how crucial private property and a free market economy were to the technological project. Why is that? Innovation cannot, by definition, be planned. To the extent that property is privately owned and not centrally controlled, and to the extent that a free market economy is competitive, there is a greater possibility for innovation. We all know this. In his canonical work, which marked the beginning of modern economics, Adam Smith argued in The Wealth of Nations, 1776, that a free market economy encourages innovation. It was innovative because the division of labor led to the specialization, and specialization led to innovation as well as greater productivity. Smith's example, you'll recall it, Many in this room will. The manufacturing of pins explains how an assembly line of narrowly focused specialists is more productive. Once we focus on one part of a process, we are apt to invent labor-saving devices. Because it is in the best vehicle, then, for innovation, the free market economy is the best form of economic system for encouraging the technological project. Finally, the historical empirical argument for the advantage of a free market economy is the 1989 implosion of its opposite, the Soviet Union. I was there. Almost everywhere now in the world, it is admitted that a free market economy is the most efficient method for engaging in the technological project. Now, while private property has always existed, Governments from time immemorial have regulated and controlled them in varying degrees to advance their own purpose and not for the technological project. To get the maximum advantage out of a market economy, it needs to be as free as possible to foster maximum innovation. Government or the state can play a limited but useful function by providing a legal system for producing and protecting the rights of individuals, especially private property, for enforcing contracts, and for dispute resolution. 
In order for a free market economy to function, it requires a limited government known as a commercial republic. A republic is a government of laws, not of men. A republic is not a democracy, for democracy involves majority rule and not constitutional rule. From Plato and Aristotle right through the 18th century, American founding, an important point, democracy was rejected as mob rule. Democracy technically means majority rule and in practice becomes a system of political economy in which the bottom 51% progressively loot the wealth and productivity of the top 49%. Democracy was understood by the American founders as part of a system of checks and balances that prevents one interest from imposing its will upon the others. Democracy, as Madison made clear in many of the Federalist Papers, is a negative device for blocking one powerful interest group or faction from imposing its will on others. Democracy was never intended as a positive device for articulating a suspect common good. It was during the 19th century in Europe that democracy as majority rule was posited as the will of the people. That is when Tocqueville and Mill came to view democracy as a threat, as the tyranny of the majority. It evolved into the formal notion that what is right is what the majority decides or that the common good is what the majority decides it is on any given occasion. Now in the post-Renaissance, and particularly Reformation period, Protestants, especially in America, saw an important connection between politics and economics. The desire for political equality was not the desire to exercise power for power's sake, or certainly to remake society. On the contrary, Protestants were largely focused on protecting the private sphere and the spiritual dimension from political corruption. The connection between politics and economics derived from the fact that government controlled large parts of the economy, granting privileges such as monopolies, sinecures, land grants, other things. Political equality implied economic equality in the sense that all possessed the liberty to pursue God's work in this world, not as an equal distribution of the spoils. Part of the meaning then of political equality was equality before the law. And equality before the law meant appeal to the rule of law and not the whim and the wishes of any given political leader or faction. Crucial to the development of the rule of law in England and in America was the theologian Richard Hooker, who adopted Thomistic notions of natural law to the Church of England and influenced John Locke, who quotes him extensively in the Second Treatise. Now, the demand for equality before the law was an expression of the notion of Christian liberty. In rejecting a hierarchical conception of the world, Protestants could accept that the political realm was no longer subordinate to the religious realm, but at the same time, the political realm had to respect the traditional spiritual realm of Christianity, what we call religious liberty. That realm, as understood in Protestant terms, meant the opportunity to do God's work by transforming the world economically. Equality before the law came to mean that there should be no legal barriers to economic activity that did not apply equally to everyone. Placing legal barriers in the economic realm was tantamount to thwarting God's plan. The rule of law has evolved jurisprudentially into meaning a legal system that constrains government. Typically, in practice, the powers of government, and here we have lots of government professors, are divided among separate branches with an independent judiciary. You're aware of that. Due process and equal protection of the law protects the rights of individuals by constitutional means. It is a system of rules designed to allow individuals to pursue their self-defined interests 
without interfering with that same pursuit on the part of others. The rule of law provides the rules of the game without determining the outcome of the game. Now, there is an important connection between spiritual capital and responsibility. Let me make that case. Purpose refers to a person's belief that life has meaning. Autonomy refers to a person's belief that it is in his or her power to fulfill that meaning through his or her own acts. Creativity ultimately comes down then to small solitary acts in which an individual conceives of something new, something innovative, gives it a try. Without knowing for sure how it will turn out, these streams then of accomplishment are more common, more extensive in cultures where doing new things and acting autonomously are encouraged rather than disapproved. In order for a government to remain limited and not become either authoritarian or, God forbid, totalitarian, or subject to mob rule, it is necessary that the citizens of that government be special kinds of people. They must be autonomous, responsible people. Such people are those who rule themselves, i.e. they impose order on their own lives through self-discipline by exercising the virtues in order to achieve goals that they have set for themselves. The so-called Protestant work ethic, I don't think it's gone, promoted the notions of inner directed individuals, an emphasis on achievement through work, equality before the law, and differentiation based on the merits of achievement. It is the combination of the technological project and free market economy that account for the appearance of a new person, a new persona in our midst. In America in particular, that person has a name, the entrepreneur. In the 17th century, we find the first use of the term entrepreneur from the French word entreprenante to undertake something. The entrepreneur discovers or imagines new ways of combining resources to create new products or new methods of production. The entrepreneur engages in what Joseph Schumpeter was later to call creative destruction. Autonomous people practicing virtue are interdirected and are therefore capable of participating, fully participating in the technological project in creative and constructive ways. In fact, the ultimate purpose, I would argue, of that project is not simply to create wealth, but to allow autonomous people to express their freedom and how such freedom reflects God's will. Wealth is a means to achievement and freedom, not an end in itself. It is in this sense that the technological project is to be understood as what we call the spiritual quest of modernity. This too is America's quest. The ultimate rationale for technological prowess is not consumer satisfaction, but the production of the means of accomplishment. Our greatest fulfillment comes from freely imposing order on ourselves in order to impose a creative order on the world. We have now come full circle. We started with the technological project, and we now have explained that even the technological project itself is an expression of spiritual capital. The Judeo-Christian roots of autonomy are evident. It is the culmination of the Christian doctrine of free will and responsibility transposed to the civil sphere. Social scientists will offer some resistance at this point. Those committed to scientism or some forms of positivism may concede that religious belief measurably has played some even minor, sig minorly significant role in affecting market behavior and social institutions in the past and present, but they normally and quite defensively think that they ought not to have this influence in the future. My argument, on the contrary, 
is that the spiritual dimension is a necessary condition for the continued vitality of free societies. Any form of scientism is intellectually deficient, and scientism itself cannot generate an adequate account of ethical principles. Autonomous people want to run their own lives. They do not want government or any other institutions to control them. They are jealous of their liberties, and they want the government to be restricted to its proper sphere. They are focused on taking care of themselves and not looking out and, and not looking for others to take care of them. The abuse of democratic procedure requires the political and legal machinery of checks and balances that our founders gave us. Political machinery ultimately depends on a larger cultural context. We are therefore brought back again to the need for a culture that preserves something like the importance of individuality and human flourishing, what we call spiritual capital. Autonomous people want recognition of this autonomy, and they want it, and they get it from other autonomous people who understand what self-discipline requires. Autonomous people seek to promote autonomy in others in order to encourage this recognition. They certainly believe in helping others. I won't deny that. But promoting the autonomy of others does not mean redistribution. It means equality of opportunity, not equality of result. It means holding everyone accountable, not condescension. It means, when necessary, teaching others how to fish, not giving them a fish. Autonomy is not zero sum. The ultimate self-interest of autonomous people is never in conflict with the ultimate self-interest of others. In the ancient and medieval world, there was no poverty problem. Almost everyone was poor. <laughs> and poverty was considered the natural and unavoidable condition of the human race. Now, as a result of the technological project, and only in these past three and a half centuries, we have now a situation where we can contemplate a world of such abundance that no one, or few, will be poor in the absolute sense. A world marked by ever-increasing growth and opportunity. It's a world they never imagined. What are the global implications of the foregoing? A national government is obliged, I think, to serve the market economy, not only at home, but abroad. One of the consequences, therefore, of modern commerce is the potential end of war, what Kant referred to as perpetual peace. As Kant went on to argue, commercial republics do not go to war with each other. This hypothesis has enormous empirical support. It has been argued that in the last 200 years since Kant wrote Perpetual Peace, there have been no major wars where all of the combatants on both sides have been commercial republics. This leads to the, four, to the following tension and, in a sense, paradox. Domestically, the government is to maintain a low profile and a fairly passive supportive role for commerce but in the international context, the government is to promote activity and actively along the entire panoply of the technological project, free market economies, limited government, and the rule of law. To intervene in foreign affairs to bring about this result is incumbent upon free governments. It is no use pretending that the implications could be otherwise. The next American president, whoever he, I could say she, but it looks like he, is, must abide by and within the established heritage of America's long-established spiritual capital. He cannot deny it, reject it, or pretend it away. The democratic ideal of interventionist socialism we have toyed with surely must come to an end, as it is at odds with what we have defined as America's true spiritual heritage. Hopefully I've made the case that America's success and leadership have an integral relationship to its accumulated spiritual capital. 
And our heritage is under assault from a variety of sources today. We therefore need to re-identify the unique content of America's Judeo-Christian spiritual capital. In many ways, this is what has essentially come to define America. In the process, we must also identify the origins and sources of the current attacks on that spiritual capital, on Judeo-Christian spiritual capital. Who are they? What are they? They include, most notably, perennial, heretical, utopian Gnosticism, now in the forms of socialism. Rousseau, Marx derived narratives of complaint about modernity. Militant secularism, which is certainly on the rise. And of course, dangerously, we know militant radical Islam. We must rebut these attacks. Indeed, America, I will argue, will not survive without a renewal of its Judeo-Christian spiritual capital. Specifically, this means the importance of personal autonomy and responsibility, stemming from the dignity of the human being as a human person, and the need to support civil association with a robust, content-full morality. At no place, you'll notice, did I advocate a theocracy or anything less than a democratic republic that is rooted in commerce and ultimately produces human flourishing. I would, however, advocate the rejuvenation of Judeo-Christian spiritual capital as a cultural phenomenon, the non-apologetic expression of one's faith, the re-education of misguided clerics, educators, the media, and America's leaders, and most of all, direct, honest, lawful, and vigorous confrontation of America's critics and its enemies. My friends, tradition tells of a chime that changed the entire world when it rang on July 8th, 1776. It was the sound from the Tower of Independence Hall summoning the citizens of my hometown and Nick's hometown, something else we have in common, Philadelphia, to hear the first public reading of the Declaration of Independence by Colonel John Nixon. Now, the Pennsylvania Assembly had ordered that bell in 1751 to commemorate, you remember, the 50th anniversary of William Penn's Charter of Privileges, which was Pennsylvania's original constitutional. It spoke of the rights and freedoms valued by people the world over. Particularly insightful were Penn's ideas on religious freedom, his stance on American rights, and his inclusion of citizens in enacting laws. Later, that same Liberty Bell gained iconic importance when abolitionists, in their efforts to put an end to slavery throughout America, adopted it as a symbol. As the bell was created to commemorate the golden anniversary of Penn's charter, the quotation, and I quote, proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof, taken from Leviticus 25.10, seemed particularly apt. I ask you in conclusion, will you join me in ringing that same bell again? to defend and re-articulate America's spiritual capital. I guess we have time for what? One question? No. <laughs> Emily is my student. I get to go first. <laughs> um, 
That was an exciting, lovely talk. Thank you. You're right. I did like it. Um, my question is uh, the technological process, progress, a project that comes from the word for art, and art means making or creating, and there's a tendency in the modern world for that project to turn into the will to power. Comment a little about that and what, what, what you find ingrained in that project or inherent in it that resists that tendency. Yeah, some people um, on the left and in the humanities, uh, and at Yale, I should say, are quite afraid of technology and the technological project as we've defined it. Um, and I'm talking about, or Nick and I are talking about, everything in the last 400 years which has a scientific basis that has contributed to human betterment. So that certainly includes the arts, but it includes such sciences as medicine, advances in economics and law. You know, I, I guess you know my last name is Scottish. My grandfather was born in Scotland. I still belong to all the Scottish clubs and associations. The modern world was largely invented during 50 years from 1750 to 1790 in Scottish universities. Um, <laughs> I'm not biased. <laughs> I didn't wear my kilt, though, today. <laughs> but whenever I hear the bagpipes, I do get a little emotional. Um, and that technological project was really invented there and then and spread its wings over the course of the next centuries and around the world. And we are the beneficiaries. So while I say, yeah, there's uh, some cost associated with certain technologies, we actually see that um, the cure to some of those things are actually present already in the next evolution of those same technologies. So we have really transformed the world. We are living longer, better, more healthy, more informed. My word system crashed the other night and I wasn't sure of that, but more technological lives than ever. And frankly, you know, our children are on a trajectory that is even far beyond what we've experienced. We were joking the other night, I think some of us at dinner, about the cell phones we used to have. You know, we'd carry them around like this, right? Now our little cell phones are more powerful than all the computing that sent the Apollo astronauts into space. Yeah, it's scary, but true. So can we put that technology to good use? I hope and think so. Dr. Young, I don't know if you were part of the conversation earlier this morning about 47% uh, and distancing you know, ourselves from that. I know Governor Romney completely disavowed that comment last night on Hannity. Wondering, sir, if you might comment on a little bit of the brass tacks of recultivating Judeo-Christian spiritual capital. What's that look like relationally, uh, particularly in thinking about Osganis' phrase, uh, not wolves at the door, but termites in the floor, thinking about the internal dynamics of, of the conversation this morning. What's that look like to recultivate Judeo-Christian spiritual capital with our neighbors? Well, that's, that's a very big topic. An entire uh, lectures, books indeed have been written on it. I wrote an earlier book called Renewing American Culture, and a lot of my work at Yale revolves around this, this question. Um, and I think a, a lot of it begins, frankly, in the places that you inhabit. So I mean to pay you a compliment to say that American higher education, and in particular the liberal arts college, and in particular the church-oriented or somehow related to um, church background colleges, are the backbone of that spiritual capital. Yale and Harvard used to be those. Do I have to remind you? I mean, Yale was founded as a seminary for congregationalist ministers. It's gone a long way from there. Our political spectrum at Yale begins with Barack Obama on the right. <laughs> We had a celebration last year of Bill Buckley's uh, very famous, now 60th anniversary of Bill Buckley's God and Man at Yale. And we, we turned out a large audience, but I jokingly say there still is no God or man at Yale. Um, yeah, so we, we have some work to do at the core of our society and in every facet of that society. So we need to do that in our families, 
first of all. But we have to be faithful persons. Let's even precede that. We have to exhibit those spiritual exercises in our families. We have to practice those virtues in our mediating institutions. The Father spoke about that last night beautifully. I'm a big advocate of mediating structures. The schools are absolutely critical at every level. But we have to be willing to take that argument into the public arena. Because if we don't, we will be as guilty as the Christians were in Nazi Germany. Because when they come to get you, the opportunity will already have been lost. So we have to defend religious liberty first. We have to re-articulate these uh, great documents of the founding. We have, uh, a lot of our students don't know the founders. We have to teach them about the founding. That's a beginning place. I teach MBA students at Yale. And I'm, now I hope this isn't on camera. I guess it is. I'd be very careful. Um, most of my students don't know what a virtue is. They've never heard the word virtue. Now, they're a little more familiar with the word vice because <laughs> they read trashy novels and, you know, listen to rap music and have watched Miami Vice, but they have no clue of what virtue is. So we have work to do. We do have time for one final question. At the conclusion of the answer, please remain in your seats for an announcement from the podium. Thank you. My name is Jay Cardalawai. Uh, before I ask you the question, I have to give a little bit of background about myself. My great-grandfather became a Christian in the 1870s. I'm from India. and. Uh, Typically, we were Baptists and Mennonite brethren. Now, I migrated to the United States in 1975, and I have attended the Baptist Church as well as the Mennonite Brethren Churches. When you were making certain statements, specifically about the Judeo-Christian aspect of it, are we indirectly or directly leaning ourselves into a state of theocracy, you would, which you denounced, but it still creates doubts in the minds of the people. If that's the path we want to take, is it fair to all Christians who believe in the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? And the way they have been led to salvation, to be Christians. I firmly believe that saving knowledge has saved me to be a Christian and to serve a Christian institution. But if you demark or delineate some section of the society by using this specific that either you fall in line with our thinking or you are the enemy, how can you justify that statement, sir? Well, I, I certainly wouldn't want to categorize uh, different religious groups as enemies. In, in fact, my writing is quite the opposite. It has all to do with uh, religious liberty, and that includes not only for Jews or Christians, but for every other faith, and actually for people who have no faith at all. And I would underscore that two times, three times. If you look at the work I've done at Yale, I've gone out of my way to write case studies on companies that come not only from Christian backgrounds, but come out of the Parsi faith in India, out of Islam, from Hinduism and Buddhism. So I, I actually believe very strongly in religious liberty. And America as a country is a place that has been a beacon on that front, that has allowed people to come to these shores to experience that kind of religious liberty and I would want to do everything to maintain not only the First Amendment, but that experiment in liberty. Uh, I don't think we can deviate from that. But we should also be aware that secular humanism is a form of spiritual content, and it's one with which we must do battle. <laughs>